Hey folks, it's the man with the pinky ring and a New York thing. Forget about it. Bad Brad Berkwood and you're watching the Bad Brad Berkwood show on the Ringside Report Web TV channel. Now make sure you hit that button and subscribe, whatever corner it is, and leave your comments below this episode and let's have a conversation. I hope everybody is doing well today and to my veterans around the world who tune in. Happy Veterans Day from one career military person to any of the veterans, no matter how long you served, you're true patriots. I wish you a true happy Veterans Day. And may God bless you and may God bless your families and may God bless America. Well, hey, today, it's an honor. I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm so excited to do this interview because this gentleman is a TV legend, but that's not where it ends. My father, God rest his soul, and I used to watch his show, Barney Miller that aired from 1975 to 1982. And every year that he was on, he was nominated for an Emmy. Fantastic show, great ensemble cast, hilarious, just great, great writing. But he wasn't just a big star on that. He went on to do other stuff, TV shows that he won daytime Emmys for and movies. And not only that, folks, he was a Broadway actor on and off Broadway. And if that's not enough, he was a singer. In all of my research I've done on people thus far uh, that have come on the Bad Brad Berkwood show, this gentleman's career is extensive across the board. It's an honor to welcome to my show, Hal Linden. All right, everybody, I, I shot an intro already, but I want to re-welcome my guest to the show. It's, it really is an absolute honor to have on this gentleman. There's so much to talk about. I did a lot of research. Uh, we're going we're gonna to have some fun today, folks, and I think you're going to enjoy it. My guest today is the incomparable Hal Linden. Thank you for coming on the show. A pleasure, but I'm afraid your research is all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You're bringing out the Bronx already, Hal? <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, before we get into anything Q&A, because and, we're going to talk about this, I want to personally, I'm a career Navy guy. I did 20 years. I did 20 years and 28 days in the Navy. I don't know if you could see the, one of my flags behind me, yes. my shadow box. But I know you're a veteran, too, and you served in the Army, and I want to wish you a happy Veterans Day. Ah, yes. I want to thank you for your service. Do um, <clears throat> you know what I did in the Army? We're going to get to that. I'm going to ask you that, but I, I have no doubt what you're going to tell me. But uh, <laughs> it was a little bit ahead, but I wanted to wish you a happy Veterans Day before we happy, start. Happy Veterans Day to everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Well, hey, before we go Q&A, let's talk what's going on right now, COVID. COVID. How are you coping, Hal? I'm coping by sitting alone in my house. Um, I don't... Uh, I don't have to tell you there's very little sh uh, shooting going on, although I do start a, uh, an indie picture next week. Um, and have a very good company with myself. Okay. And uh, doing a lot of reading and walking. Okay. There's a nice little park behind my, my apartment and I, I do my walking there fully masked. I do my walking. Okay. <clears throat> what I want to do is I want to start out at the beginning. So I want to go back to the Bronx. I want to go back to when you were Harold Lipschitz. Is that okay? Be my guest. Okay. Let's start out there. And if you would, talk about growing up in the Bronx when you did. The Bronx is part of New York. And one thinks of New York as the sophisticated capital of the world. Let me tell you how provincial the Bronx was. I lived on Bryant Avenue. I walked out my door and looked to your left. The furthest you could see was the water tower on the RKO Chester building, which was about six blocks to my left. If you look to the right, you saw the roof of the telephone company building, which is about six blocks to my right. That was my universe. I thought that you fell off the end of the world when you pass those th places. Uh, and that's how 
provincial my neighborhood was. Uh, there, it was a, a second generation immigrant neighborhood. So we had a big Jewish population, a big Irish population, and a big Italian population. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's all I knew about the world. That and what I saw on Saturday night when my parents took me to the movies and I saw the rest of the world. So, um, <clears throat> sophisticated, hardly. I'll, I'll tell you, for instance, I never spoke to a black person until I went to high school. Wow. Wow, indeed, in New York City. Right, right. Wow, that's how provincial. Hmm. And that's how much of, a, of, a, of an influence and, a, and an opening high school was in my mind. Right. And the only reason was because I went to a centralized high school, not to a uh, neighborhood high school. I went to the High School of Music and Art because right. I was a musician. <clears throat> and that, that eye-opening to the whole world. Interesting. Do you often, well, pre-COVID, do you go back east or not that much? Do you go back east at all? Uh, this way. Yeah. Zoom. <laughs> I'll tell you the truth. I'm seeing my kids a lot more than I used to because we have a regular Zoom conversation every uh, Sunday. Okay, that's great. Well, we're going to get into all the different things that you did career-wise, but I was curious. I, I know you sang, and we're going to talk about that. I know Broadway, but growing up in your household, now, who did your parents listen to on the phonograph? Who did you hear? Wow. <laughs> Who did I hear? Jolson? Say it again? Did you hear Jolson? Did he play Al Jolson? I heard Jolson, but I think that was, yeah, that was on the radio. We heard yeah. Jolson. It was mostly radio. I don't remember them playing records. Okay. But mostly radio, whatever, whoever was on the radio. Okay. I personally, uh, the big influence on the radio when I got to turn the dial myself was, the Nat King Cole show in mm -hmm. 19, what, 45 or something. Right. That, that was the music that I wanted to make. Okay. Which is, we're going to move a little bit forward. Uh, looking at your bio, did you go in the Army after you were singing with big bands, or were you doing the big band first? Both. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, did the big band first. Okay. You have to understand that, I was a, a musician mm -hmm. and when I, in, I joined the Musicians Union in 1945. I was only 14 years old. Wow. But there were no musicians around. Everybody was busy fighting war. And so I became a professional musician at age 14. Mm. And they didn't start coming home from, from the the war until what 47 48 you know when they finally got everybody home so i was playing with big bands at age 15 16 uh and that carried over right up until i was drafted at age well i got through college so i was something like 20 21 something okay. like that now one of the bands you you play with how was uh sammy k now before and after the army Okay. Did you come after, I was friendly with, my Uncle Stan was really good friends. I met him one time and had lunch with him. Did you come into to Sammy Kay's band after Don Cornell left? After Don Cornell left. After Don Cornell left. Okay. I, I figured that looking at the dates, because I know when, I pretty much know when Don went solo. Talk about, I, I love Sammy Kay. Swing and sway with Sammy Kay. Great, I, I grew up, my father was much older than me. I, I played with Sammy just before, as a matter of fact, I got drafted while I was on tour with Sammy, uh, which was very interesting. I was in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and I got on my first airplane to fly home to get drafted. I'd never been on an airplane before. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I left Sammy to go into the Army, and when I got out of the Army, uh, he was going to do a show called So You Want to Lead a Band <laughs> on ABC TV. And he hired me back because I was kind of, I was also one of the cadets, you know, who sang behind the boy singer. And uh, 
there was a, a boy singer, I don't recall his name, but he was, a, uh, he was a little lazy. So whenever we got requests for very new songs, <laughs> Sammy would, I could do it, Sammy. And he'd let me go up and sing those songs. So I was this, like the understudy singer on the band. Oh, wow, that's cool. Yeah. And Sammy, and I know you know this now, what I liked with Sammy, because Don told me this, and I, I've heard it, I mean, I've heard the records, Sammy would give, he would say your name. Like when you'd go into a song, he would say, and now my boy sing or whatever, he would say, Don Cornell, or how, or, by then you were how Limit, right? There was a piece of music, uh, an eight bar phrase in every arrangement for him to do that. Or it would change key for the, for the next singer. Okay. That led you, as you said, you were drafted. Now, yes. we have some similarities, believe it or not. I, this, I love doing research on people that come on the show, especially when there's something that I could really, really talk about. You got drafted. You were stationed at Fort Belvoir with the Army. Now, I wasn't stationed at Fort Belvoir because I was Navy. But I shopped at the PX because I lived in, when you were there, it was probably all farmland. But I lived there in, 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 in the 1990s is when I was there. It, it had been settled by human beings. It had been settled, okay. It wasn't totally well, I lived in a city. In the 17th century. So <laughs> okay, right. years ago. Let's not overdo it. <laughs> so, I, love, I love having New Yorkers on. They give it right back. <laughs> I don't know if you recall a town called Dale City or Woodbridge, Virginia. Does that ring a bell? Okay. About 15 minutes away. But I, I went to that base. I shopped at the PX, the commissary, went to the hospital there, the whole nine. Talk about your time, if you would, when you were stationed at Fort Belvoir with the Army Band. Well, I wasn't with the Army Band. Okay. It was with the 356th Army Band. There was another band on the other side of the uh, base, the 75th Army Band. Uh, interestingly enough, Ours was a white band. That was a black band. Hmm. Segregation. I was there when they integrated. It was one of the last things integrated in the Army. Uh, and they integrated the bands. They took six uh, kids from the North, <laughs> New Yorkers, or big city, who they figured could handle it. Mm -hmm. And I guess they sent over the kind of the least activist black kids into the, our band. So I finished my, my tour of duty in a black band. Okay. Now you may ask, what was the difference between a white band and the black band? Right. The street beat. Yeah. Most of the street beat, the street beat is what, you, what the drums are playing between when the, when the band is just marching. And in the, uh, in the 356, it was. In the 75th band, it was. Different. Right. Now, what, what was your, was your MOS a musician or what was your MOS? Musician. You were a musician. Originally, I think that for half an hour I was an engineer or something. <laughs> and then I got, because that's the engineer post. Okay, right, right. And, and they sent me there, I guess, to be an engineer, but it, I immediately got into the band. Now, did you go through, I joined through Brooklyn MEPS. Did you go through Brooklyn MEPS? Did you go through the Navy Yard to process? No. No? Nope. Went to, right, right to, uh, Belvoir, as far as I remember, it's a okay. little, quite a while ago. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, if the story is correct, while you were stationed at Fort Belvoir, somebody told you about Guys and Dolls, the production company of Guys and Dolls, or is that not true? No, you got it. it no, it's just a little. In, in essence, you're right. Okay. What happened was uh, Fort Belvoir is right next to the Military District of Washington, which is a separate command. We were First Army, I think. The Military District of Washington is a very small unit just around Washington, D.C. that takes care of all the military personnel in, in Washington, which is a lot. But it also handles uh, Hudson's Bay, Canada, where they do research, and a research center in Panama or something. They handle all those. 
It was a very small unit that did not have its own piano player. So whenever they wanted to do an entertainment thing, they did have a public, uh, what do you call it? Um, whatever the, the unit was called. Okay. They did have a unit to do it, but they didn't have a piano player. So they always used to borrow our piano player. Now this preceded my ever getting there. So every so often this piano player with whom I played every weekend at the officers club and the services club, he knew all my songs, he knew what I sang, he knew my keys, you know, everything. He used to go away for about a week and do a show with uh, this special services unit in Washington. And one time he just turned to me and he said, listen, I'm doing another show with the special services unit up at MDW. I, you want to sing a song? I can have them borrow you too. Now this just stop in time. I didn't ask him. He asked me. So you always say the rest of your life, what if he didn't ask me? Would my life have been totally different? Okay. I think so. The it, point is I went with them and I sang a song. First time I ever sang a song without a saxophone hanging around my neck. It was actually staged. So I had a, I believe it was a, a teacher and the students and I was singing to the students. So uh, already I was playing a character and then I went and did a, a couple of lines in a sketch. And, and those are the guys who said, you know, the guys and dolls has come into town. Now, I, I come from New York. I never went to the theater. I, 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 not only, ha I never was in the uh, acting uh, group in high school or college. Never set foot on a stage. I, I think in sixth grade, I did a class play or something. I, my mind was totally focused on being a musician. And, uh, but here I went to the theater and saw Guys and Dolls, the, the road company of Guys and Dolls. Jules Munchen played. Oh, I remember Jules. Nathan. And somebody I ended up knowing very well played Sky. And I remember sitting in the seat and saying, that, A, I think I could do that. You know, what's the line from, from Chorus Line? I can mm -hmm. do that. I can do that. And it looked like fun. So when, when I, now, when I got into the army, there was uh, Woody Herman. And his thundering. And Kenton, Count Basie, uh -huh. Duke, uh, Billy May, sort of Finnegan. The, it was the height of great big band jazz. And I, that was the, my concept was to return to that, if you will. When I got out, they were all disbanded. And I remember, I got, the first job I got was with Sammy Kay playing on uh, uh, She Wanna Lead a Band. And when, he, when, he, uh, when the show was about to be canceled at the end of the run, the, comp the band manager came and said, um, we're gonna go on the road. If you, you let me know if you wanna go, because if you don't, I'll have to replace you. So there I was sitting, thinking to myself, what do I want to do? <laughs> Go back out on the road with the band, stay, play locally. And the guests that week were Bill Haley and the Comets. <laughs> Rock around the clock. <laughs> and I remember sitting in my chair watching them rehearse. He had a saxophone player who played one note. Ah, 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 and I remember saying to myself, I have seen the future and I don't think I want any part of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so I used my GI Bill and I went to the American Theater Wing to start studying, see what theater was going to be about. Because I had had that experience in the Army. That, that started the whole thing. Did you, did you study with Lee or Stella Adler or any of them? Uh, I studied with uh, Paul Mann and Lloyd Richards. Okay. And you usually eventually, eventually, I started at the American Theater Wing. Uh, 
didn't really get much of a sense of anything there and immediately got my first job in summer stock. It, I didn't really start studying till I got to Broadway and I was doing the lead in Broadway. And I said, you know, I think I better figure out what the hell I'm doing here. Okay. I'm kind of winging it according to what it looked like I should be doing. I never, it was then that I went to Paul and uh, started studying. Okay. Now, you, even though you said the Army was a long time ago, you use one of the acronyms. I know what it means. You said NDW, which stands for Naval District Washington. MDW, Military District of Washington. Well, well right, they, now, but I'm saying now with the Navy, they call they say NDW. NDW. There's a lot of military, a lot of a Navy stuff on it. But right, the District of Washington. So it, it, it that part, the one word changed. But the Military District of Washington, the district right, didn't that none of that. They still they still talk about uh, that acronym. Yeah. All these years later. Okay. Uh, you in '58. Does that mean if I go back in, I can, I know it? No. Yeah. You're on a flat. We'll, we'll take you in. You look great. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, you look great. You said you walk, so you're you're in good shape. We'll take I'm you. Still functioning. Let's put it that way. There you go. If I could, and if it's if it's too personal, I understand. But I had a note um, around that time. I know Mrs. Linden passed passed away sadly. God rest her soul. I I wanted to to bring her up because of the fact that when I was doing research on you, I saw so many beautiful pictures of you together with your family, and I wanted to give you because I always like to give a 180 of the person I interview. I wanted to give you, if you can, if you would, uh, a chance to talk about Miss Mrs. Linden because you had 50, if I'm correct, 52 years was that's a mitzvah, Hal. That's a mitzvah. God bless you and God bless her. And could you talk, could you talk about her a little bit? Well, first of all, let me tell you, she's responsible for my career as well as four kids and, uh, and 52 years of marriage. She was a swing dancer in the show Bells Are Ringing. Swing dancer is the general understudy for all the dancers. She has to know every part. And at the, uh, while she was doing that, I was in summer stock in, uh, the end of Connecticut, almost, almost Rhode Island. And the standby for Sidney Chaplin in Bells Are Ringing, whose name eludes me now, but he was a wonderful actor. Standbys are established actors who understudy major roles. They're not in the play. Their only function is to be available for the leading actors. Uh, anyway, uh, he was leaving to do a, another play or something, and the the production decided to make it a, this was about the, almost two years into the run, to make it an understudy. Somebody who would go into the chorus and be part of the chorus as well. Uh, and I was perfectly willing to do that. I had, what, two seasons of summer stock under my belt? I didn't even have an agent. And she went to the stage manager and said, I think I know a guy who would be just perfect for this role. I had to drive from end of Connecticut into New York just to audition for the stage manager so that I could audition for the audition person, casting person. I, I went back and forth about f almost five times, I think, I think four times to audition for different people moving up the chain. Finally, uh, I was a chorus. I was in the in the chorus on the Perry Como television show. Summer stock was over. I was now on uh, under Ray Charles, not the piano player Ray Charles, the chorus master Ray Charles, or as he used to say, not the blind one, the deaf one. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I was working the Perry Como show, which shot on a Saturday. And I remember I, we were rehearsing the Como show all day. When we broke for, for lunch, uh, dinner at 5 o'clock, I ran over to the Schubert Theater and auditioned for Judy Holiday. She had to be the last one to say okay. She said okay. I went back, did the Perry Como show. I told Ray Charles, I can't do next week because I'm going into the bells are ringing. After the Perry Como show, I got my car, drove to Long Island, and played a bar mitzvah on the saxophone. 
and told that band leader I couldn't work with him next Saturday because I was going into rehearsal. I went into rehearsal on Monday with a stage manager and a book. And he gave me all the staging. We worked all week. Saturday morning was the understudy rehearsal. All the understudies came in and we actually ran the scenes. And in the middle of it, he came out and said, keep rehearsing because you're on today. And I made my Broadway de debut. I had never been on a Broadway stage in my life. And I made my Broadway debut in the leading role opposite Judy Holiday. Consider that. That's, that's not the, the fascinating part was I wasn't the least bit nervous. Hmm. I amazed myself. I wasn't nervous. I just went on, did what I was supposed to do, did it. Obviously did it very well because on Monday they changed me to a standby. <laughs> okay. And, and put me on a, on a long term because as an understudy, I just had to give two weeks notice. Right. Standby long term contract. But that opp that opportunity doesn't come if Mrs. Linden didn't give you didn't give the thumbs up there you or know, the word to get you there. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, uh, we married while in in Belzerine. Judy came to the uh, to the to the wedding. Wow. Well, like I said, I, the, the pictures I saw of you with the kids and all that, I, it touched me because it really, I mean, you, you could you could just tell, you know. She, it, she was also a very talented lady. Uh, she was a, a dancer, singer, actress. She did a lot of uh, TV eventually when we, went, when we moved to California, did a few things in New York as well. But uh, more than that, or well, first, first mom and raised four kids while I was you know, trying to make something of myself. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Um, Judy Holiday. I wanted to talk a little bit about Judy Holiday because I watched clips of you and I know you're very fond of her. You spoke very highly of Judy Holiday. She wasn't people. She dealt with McCarthy BS in the fifties. She dealt with that. She didn't name names. They tried to run her out of the business. Sadly, she died. I think of breast cancer. Very, very young. 40s. In her 40s. I watched a clip of you where you talked about her, uh, you were singing and she turned you around because she wanted you to be seen as yeah. well. Talk this was the first time I ever went on stage with her. And we, we had never rehearsed together. So I'd only rehearsed with standbys and understudies. So the song was Just In Time, the probably the most famous song from that show, Just In Time. And it's done very simply. We walk on stage left, have a little scene, and I take her in my arms as if we're going to dance. And we dance across the stage. And while I'm dancing, I sing into her ear, as it were, you know, just in time. I found you just in time. And I took her in my arms and sang in her ear. Played it for real. And as we were moving, I realized her hand was on my back and she was twisting me and we were now doing it this way. I couldn't. And then I realized very quickly that she was just turning me so that I was facing the audience and her back was to the audience because it was me singing. That kind of stage generosity you don't always find in 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 stars on broadway or <laughs> on the screen that kind of she did half the show with her back to the audience because it was somebody else's scene mm. and as i say that's that's such a rarity class i love hearing stories class, class and generosity right uh, just a joy just a joy okay yeah now when they brought it to Hollywood, and they made a movie. Now, you, you in uh, Bellarine, you played uh, Jeff Moss, right? It's the leading man. Leading man, correct. Now, I know when they brought it to Hollywood, they cast Dean. Some, guy, some other guy. <laughs> but you, but you were still in the movie. How you play? You had a, even though they say uncredited, but you sang Midas, Midas Touch. They, um, that was Judy's idea. I bet. I had a Judy's idea. She. 
uh, there was somebody else had an idea of doing uh, putting some it was a chorus number on Broadway right but she wanted you to do it what they wrote a whole new start to it okay and then somebody to do it and that was Judy's idea that I do it okay yes all right now in 62 you went on to do anything goes now before I ask you anything I got to tell you You've been playing, Debbie can tell you, you've been playing YouTube videos of you singing, and I, what I do is I hit loop, which means it just plays it over and over again. I've listened to you sing now probably 50 times with Bob Berlin, It's the Lovely, the great Cole Porter song. And you did a hell of a cover. I mean, fantastic job. Which, which song was it? It's the Lovely. It's the Lovely. And I had I listened to you, you did a duet with Bob Berlin. Barbara Lang, right. Talk about Anything Goes. Anything Goes was, well, it was, a, it was a brilliant idea on somebody's part. I guess the time was right. Uh, the interesting thing was um, the, the, the revival of a, a show from 1935, six, something like that. And they, they, took it apart and put it back together again. They rearranged it. They took out about five songs and put in four or five songs from other Cole Porter shows. That, that should be known. That's not all one score. That wow. was, it was a Milan, right. Um, and they, and, and, uh, and it was a very strange, uh, strangely, constructed in the original, but they really did a, a good job of, of uh, making it much more accessible uh, in structure. And uh, we get, and, and not only that, uh, oh God, names are evading me. Moon, uh, Moonface, I can't remember the name, I'm terrible. Okay. Uh, he used to come in every day and say, hey, I got a joke. You say this, I say that. And we did, oh, yeah, fine. They put it in. So it was rewritten, restructured, remusicalized, but it came out wonderfully. Opening night, the original writers were there. <laughs> Quite old. And we were very nervous about what had happened, what, what the creative team had done. I had very little to do with it, uh, the, what the creative team had done. And the first thing he said was, still works. <laughs> That's a compliment. We said, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah it still works. <laughs> oh, that's cool. And it went on to be, by the way, probably the most performed musical our version in in every high school and college in america it's it's you know so kind of uh, naive as a musical it's wonderful for colleges and, and high schools okay I, I like i said i watched a lot of clips and my dad i remember my father telling me a story about you this is when you were on bonnie miller that and but i couldn't re i can't remember all of it so i watched a clip and the, the uh, interviewer asked you about nine to five jobs and you said you never waited on tables. So, which you had said that. So that ruled out, because my dad acted as well. He didn't make it big, but he did a lot of off-Broadway stuff and he studied with Lee, but he did wait tables. So that wasn't the part of the story, but somewhere back in the day, my dad did something with you. I don't know if it was a, if it was a play or Maybe you were just a, a regular in a restaurant that he worked at, which I couldn't tell you the name. But whatever it was, it stuck with him all these years later. I mean, all, all those years later, this was in the 70s. Because he pointed to me one day when you were doing Barney, he said, that guy, and I was probably 10, about 8 or 10, he said, that guy right there, back in the day, was the sweetest guy I ever met. Huh. Now, I'm not saying that you were close or anything like that. Uh, and I thought maybe you were waiters, but you said you never waited tables. I'm just curious, though. I know anything goes was off Broadway. Did you do anything else 
off Broadway as well in the, in the maybe the early sixties. Uh, the early sixties, uh, no. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to. Uh, I don't recall. I don't think I did off Broadway after that. I I, I never did uh, El Gallo. I never did, and and that ran my whole career there off Broadway. And every year they would call and say, "You want to do El Gallo?" Because it ran for like forty years. But okay, uh, I've always said that about myself. I actually never had an honest job. I have never. I never waited on tables. I never drove a cab. I never did anything other than play the saxophone or play a part. I have played my entire life. I mean, I did everything attendant to th theater show business. I did uh, demonstration records, jingles, voiceovers, backers auditions, uh, anything I could make, a, a industrial shows. I, 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 I just kept myself barely in the business for about a decade until I finally got the Rothschilds. Right, which we were going to lead into. But you know what? I heard you say that before. You never had a honest job. But you know what? I know that's a saying. It's your, your generation because my dad used to say that too a lot, that, that phrase. But you work. You still work. And you worked harder what you did. I, uh, yeah, I, I, I played. <laughs> I played the saxophone or I played a part. <laughs> okay. You led me into it. Talk about which was the... Uh, um, thing that really opened the doors for you, the Rothschilds. Talk about that. Understand there was a decade between bells ringing and the Rothschilds. A decade of doing all those things. Right, the dialogue, the voiceover. Scratching out a living and unemployment insurance. And, and uh, actually I had made a, a reputation as a standby on Broadway. So part of every year was a Broadway show standing by for some Hollywood star and it would close out of town or flop when we got back to New York and I'd go back to jingle singing or whatever I could do until the next season and I'd do an, another standby. So I was a standby on Broadway for a decade. Well, well, let me ask you this, Al, before we talk about Rothschilds with the jingles. Is there any jingles that were really big that the viewers may know? Uh, the only, I was the voice of Pan Am. When okay. Pan Am makes the going great. I'll tell you a, a line that they may remember was Sprint. Was, um, you can hear a pin drop. The very first sprint was so proud of how of how good the sound was that that was the catchphrase. You can hear a pin drop. <laughs> okay, okay. What else? Uh, I was, anyway, I did a whole bunch of commercials that kept me alive. Kept me alive. Which goes into the Rothschilds. I had not had a. I was, as I say, a standby on Broadway for a decade. That's both very good because I was earning a nice living and it kept me an actor. I didn't have to get a nine to five job, but it was incredibly frustrating <laughs> that you never get on there and actually do it. Uh, till, Well, the first thing was I had a small part in it. I finally got a small part in a show called The Education of Hyman Kaplan, where I had a, a, a wonderful number in this. I was a villain, more or less. And I had a wonderful number in the second act that night after night was the closest thing to a showstopper I've ever had on Broadway. And I thought, this is going to make it. That now I'm going to, this is going to be my big break. And every night, terrific response. Just great. Opening night. Opening night, I say, finally going to break through. I do my number in the second act. 
polite applause. I walked off stage stunned. Oh my God, I blew it. I blew my big chance. What, what did I do different? What, what happened? Why did, going up to my dressing room and there was an elevator operator. And as I got on the elevator, he said, do you hear what happened tonight? I said, what, what, what happened? Martin Luther King was assassinated. Oh my gosh. During the intermission, they came in and got Mayor Lindsay out of the audience to go up to Harlem because there were riots in Harlem. And the audience was just, that's what they were all about. The lights went down, <laughs> went up. I came up and did my great number. They're worrying about the world breaking up behind them. So that, that was my big wow. chance on Broadway. The good news is a lot of people on Broadway did come to see it and saw, the, saw my performance, either before that or in, in previews. And that led to, the immediate thing it led to was um, Larry Blyden was leaving the apple tree and uh, Sheldon Harnick, whom I had known from Anything Goes back half a decade ago because he was courting his wife. <laughs> she was, uh, Margie Gray was in, in the show and mm -hmm. we got to know each other then. Uh, he, he got me uh, as a replacement of Larry Blyden. Now here's the, <laughs> when, I, when I was selected to be the replacement, the, the guy who was understudying both major roles quit because he didn't get the job. So they said to me, you can have the part and here's the money, but you have to stand by for Alan Alda, who was the lead. So here I, I'm, I'm looking to get out of this standby mold. But they said, I, so I, I, I compromised with them. I said, I will, I'll do it, but I want Larry's billing. And Larry had, there were three, Alan Alder, Barbara Harris, and Larry Blyden. And they all had over the title star billing. And I said, I'll take, you give me that over the title star billing and I'll, so I, I may have been the only actor on Broadway with over the title star billing who was still a standby. <laughs> okay, that took principle. <laughs> okay, that was uh, Sheldon, the, the work of Sheldon Harnick. He's having written that, he, he was the one who recommended me for it. And the, Almost immediately, we started talking. He was they were working on the Rothschilds, and so uh, Sheldon and I were talking about it for a couple of years, and finally, it came to pass. Okay, you won a Tony Award for it. I saw. Yeah. I've, I've seen some clips of it. Um, from what I understand, reading reviews of it, it was it was a fantastic show. How long did it last? Actually, it only lasted about. Uh, less than two years. Okay. Um, it was a very interesting thing. <laughs> uh, structure plays a lot in in a, in a play. Uh, when I was about to leave for, for Detroit, my agent said to me, how you doing? How's it going? And I said, if I do my job well, it won't work. She looked at me like, what? <laughs> the problem with, with the piece was the structure. That my, the first act was about my generation. It was, a, it, it was, we gotta remember the Rothschilds was during the civil rights uh, movement and, and was a kind of a, uh, uh, there was a parallel how the first generation of, of us, uh, uh, people trying to get out of the ghetto function with the establishment, read uh, Thurgood Marshall, 
you know, the people of the 30s who were leading the civil rights movement. And, how, and then the second act was about how the younger generation, the newly, my sons, dealt with the, with the establishment. Read Malcolm X. So there was a, a vast difference between the two acts. The problem is that's, that's a great literary concept, but it almost impossible to pull off as a dramatic concept because this, an audience spends a whole first act following me, my character and how I got to where I get to. And all of a sudden I actually died in the second act. So, you know, they had to reinvest their emotional chips and it, it just, that, that was the reason it only lasted uh, uh, for less than two years altogether. But still you won a Tony, so obviously your performance was, was worthy. I, I, that's the problem. I did the job so well <laughs> that the sec, there's no way you could have, the second act couldn't have worked. They, that's all they ever worked on was the second act, trying to, get, trying to fix it. But it, it, was, it was almost doomed from the start. Okay. That kind of leads into Barney Miller, but I want to try to ask you some different type of things, because I know you always get asked about Barney Miller, which is which was a gem, as I said. In a clip, I saw you talking about Danny Arnold affectionately, and I noticed in researching you that you guys had three things in common. I'm sure you probably know this. One, he was a New Yorker. Two, he was an actor. What's that? The Bronx. Right, the, right, right, right. the Bronx. Uh, he, he acted. And he also was in the military, but he was a couple years older than you. He was a Marine in World War II. Right. He was so you shared those three things. I don't know if you ever discussed them, but at least you had those three things. To well, we talked about the Bronx. Okay. Definitely. Okay. Because one of the reasons was um, the show is um, set in New York. Greenwich Village, right? Right, Greenwich Village. So when we were talking about it, you know, before we, when they hired me, basically, and told me about it and sit, offered me the part, I said, why don't we shoot it in New York? Oh, my God, we can use the local locales and you got all the New York actors. He said, I hate New York. Danny said that? Yes. <laughs> I hate New York. He, I guess, you know, growing up in the Bronx, we were both not rich kids, you know, uh, it was struggling time, and uh, he struggled his way out of it. That's why I became a, a performer. He was actually a stand-up comic, and uh, later a, a, an editor. You know, and he did this all by himself, but it was out of New York. <laughs> so uh, uh, we had, you know, memories of New York, but neither one of us wanted to go back. Well, I would. I wanted to go back to, because my family was there. You know, that's where I was still living. But uh, that was the end of that. We ended. That's how I, I ended up moving to California. I've been I, here ever since. I bring him up because, like I say, you, you spoke fondly about him. I know he was a big part he of. He was. He was as close as I have ever known to a comedic genius. Okay. That he understood comedy. Situational comedy it wasn't always. It was not. It was. And Barney Miller was purely situational comedy, very little straight line punch lines. You know, it was all reaction to situations. Looks would get laughs because of the situations. And in that area, he was brilliant. Okay. Brilliant. You had mentioned in a clip, and I, I'd like you to tell the story because it was so interesting, that the pilot was not what we eventually saw that became the hit. Could you talk about the pilot, how it was different? Pilot was called The Life and Times of Barney Miller. And it included his home life. I had a wife, two children. Uh, and that pilot was not bought. That pilot was a part of the summer, you know, dead pilot season when they'd show the comedy theater of, you know, ABC comedy theater it was all dead pilots. Um, and it was dead. It was totally dead until I think it was September, October, when uh, I got, uh, September, I got a call that Danny had somehow convinced ABC to do two more episodes. Now he, it was recast. I had a different wife. 
Uh, the, the, the only one left from the first pilot was Abe. Everybody else was different. They weren't available all of a sudden in September to make a pilot in October to possibly go to work in January. And that's what happened. We made a second pilot and got a uh, half year pickup. Started shooting in January for the uh, second half of the season. Okay. What I want to do is I want to... And by the way, they, what happened was they loved the precinct stuff. Yes. But the home stuff was father knows best you know it was just a repetition of a thousand different domestic comedies so barney became totally in the uh in the in this uh squad room barbara barbara barry who played my wife was left now as a visitor mm -hmm. to the squad room she, she was a probably a bigger name than i was and she, she was left to, and they spent two years trying to fit her in. They, gave, they made her a social worker. They tried all kinds of things to, to accommodate, the, you know, not having the home set anymore. And uh, eventually, I think it was Barbara who said, this is silly, you know, and, and finally gave up. Okay. It was a great ensemble, I think one of the greatest ensemble cast ever put on a show. I mean, I really think you had some, some one great- of the greatest ensemble cast for a comedy show. Yes. What not, I, what it, not one of those actors ever got an Emmy, including myself. And you were nominated seven times every year. Yeah, That's every year. Because it, it, was, it was definitely worth it. I want to say, the, the name the, the, some of the guys and whatever the first thought is, you don't have to, uh, a whole thing, but whatever the first thought is that you recall with that actor, whatever your thoughts are. Um, Max Gale, working with Max Gale. Um, unfortunately, Max and I are the surviving members of the whole cast. I know, I know. So, you know Max was a, a free spirit. I, I had met Max in San Francisco uh, a decade before. Uh, he was a cocktail piano player. Hmm. And uh, uh, a free spirit, very big in the uh, Indian movement. I, he had played the uh, Indian in uh, the Academy Award winner. But, uh, We're not talking about the one with Dustin Hoffman, Little Big Man. No. no, 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 no. And anyway, the point is, he became very involved in the Indian movement. Okay. Uh, no, the one that took place in a in a mental institution. Oh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. Yeah. Is a, a a part of an Indian. Okay. And Max was playing that part in San Francisco when I met him. The, the Will Sam the Will Sampson played in the I movie. So. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. So. Okay. And he became very involved in the Indian movement. Uh, it, it took over his life. It was. It was. Uh, I think he's still involved in it. Okay. Is, is your 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 typical what free spirit is the word I can I can I can say because you, he was the hippie of hippies. Okay. You know. You you mentioned Abe. I watched a clip of you at his 90th birthday when he was running in place, which was funny on YouTube. You were at his birthday party. Right. I happened to be in, in New Jersey down the street yep. doing something when somebody said, you know, it's Abe's having a birthday party. And I just showed up. But I was laughing when you said, I want to tell a story. And you said, he kicked my ass in handball. When, when, when he first, this is when we went out to do the first pilot. The only, as I said, the only one that was, uh, uh, hired at the time was Abe. They hadn't cast the rest of it. And this, uh, uh, the uh, press agent wanted to do a big story of the two of, two of us. So he said, let's go to a gym together and we'll have you working out together. We can take pictures and you know, I'll do this whole story. So we went to this gym and we went like this and walk um, uh, next to each other doing a uh, walking, everything. And very softly, Abe said, 
I used to play a little handball. So what do you say, because they had a three ball, four ball handball court. Why do you say we play a little handball? I had played handball as a kid against a building, you know, with a Spalding, you know, soft yeah. rubber ball. Oh, yeah. Not sure, but take pictures there. With he ripped me a new one. He was, well, he was a, a handball player from the, from the downtown Manhattan streets where they have, you know, regular handball courts. And he, he had done it all his life. Who knew, had, who knew uh, that Tessio was I mean, handball? Tessio of all people. Tessio. Tessio of all people. And, <laughs> and a guy who looked like he was my grandfather. Exactly. exactly. Looked like he was grandma, but he wasn't that much older than me. He was in his 50s when he was on Barney. That's right. Yeah. He just looked 80. Yeah, exactly. Okay. You did uh, Jack Sue. I remember when you did the tribute show and you talked about, I can't remember if you talked about it on the show, but I think you did about, and it was very touching about him being in a Japanese internment camp. Exactly. Jack was in an internment camp. Uh, he got out of it by joining the army. And he served in Italy during the war. He had a big, uh, Jack Sue used to be six feet tall and doing a movie with John Wayne with a backpack. He slid, he was on a, uh, like a dune, a, a sand hill, and he slid down the bottom. And when he landed, his back, and he was five foot nine after that. Yeah. Jack, the, the thing that I said, and what was true is, is there was never any bitterness in Jack. Jack dealt with this horrible internment camp and the whole, excuse me, his real name is Suzuki. He's Japanese. Su is a Chinese name. He specifically picked the name because after the war, when he was trying to make a living, you couldn't have a name like Suzuki. So he had to change his name too. <laughs> uh, and um, he picked Sue, and he, he was a singer. Jack Sue, if you remember, did uh, Flower Drum Song in the movies mm -hmm. as a singer. Uh, he was billed as the Chinese Bing Crosby. That was his... Wow, yeah, I didn't know. Yes, Chinese Bing Crosby, when he was really Japanese. Uh, so there was a, obviously a lot of undercurrent in everything, but he dealt with it with humor. That was his shield. Everything was humor. There was never any bitterness or acrimony. The amazing guy. Okay. Ron Glass. Ron Glass was probably the most qualified actor on the whole stage, on the whole series. He was uh, uh, studied the uh, uh, theater at uh, had a master's in, in theater was a was a member of, of the uh, um, very famous acting company in Minneapolis uh, that was you know that was the royalty of acting and you know the rest of us, I don't think Max Gale had, had an acting lesson and I don't think I don't know what what Abe's background was, but we, none of us had done classics. Ron did all the new, all, did all the classics. Shakespearean actor, the most qualified of of all of us, <laughs> and um, and maybe the most meticulous. He was the one who dealt with every degree th that he could in his character. If you go back and watch them, you'll see him deal with little problems, you know. Yes, I do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the one who w was pretty much a stand-up was Steve Landsberg. Steve, Steve Landsberg was a stand-up. I don't know if you've ever seen Steve's act. I have. I have. Vastly different from what he did. Yes. And that was, I suspect, um, Danny had a concept of a character that uh, and just asked Steve to do that character and Steve gave all of his craziness up 
and did that the guy who had, had the, the, the proof of everything, he gets to these long stories with, the, with all the background and then <laughs> and they'll let you down. <laughs> exactly. Hilarious. Yeah. The inspector. That was a tribute to Steve. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I had never seen his act. Once I saw his act, I was like, whoa, because Steve was a madman on. I know, I'm so completely different. Completely different. Completely different. The one that used to crack me up that would come in and he would go, his character, not identical, but he almost kind of reminded me from Sanford and Son, you had Hoppy, you had the black cop and the white cop, and he would come in, he would mess up all, all the different things. He was, it wasn't always politically correct. James Gregory, would come in and he would say things to you and you'd have that look on your face like, did, I, did he just say that? Who well, had been around for years, another solid actor. Who never did comedy. Right, right. Who never he did comedy. He, he was, was a candidate. I guess Danny saw the possibility of, because Danny didn't need stand-up comics. He needed good actors who could act comedic situations. Mm -hmm. That was his point. And, um, Jimmy Gregory, Jimmy, came, Jimmy, every time he came in, he had every line, every gesture. He knew exactly what he was going to do. It was line perfect. We were still struggling with pages. And there was a certain amount of, uh, there was a certain generational difference. Jimmy approached things his way. And most, well, certainly, you know, anyone who's, who, who, my generation had studied the method, you know, so we were more organic. And he kind of snickered at it, quite mm -hmm. honestly, until he got his own show. After Barney was on the air a couple of years, they came up with a show called, I think, Detective School or something, where he was the teacher. They got themselves four or five stand up comics as students. Mm -hmm. And he was the teacher. I never saw it. I don't think it ever hit the air, or maybe it, it did while we were for a couple of shows. But he showed up one night on the set when we when he was not working. Uh, I think he had a couple of drinks. Hmm. And hey, Jim. Hey, wait, good to see you. How's the show going? You know, what 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 are you doing? It was like midnight or one o'clock in the morning and he said i just wanted to see real actors he was so he had all these stand-up comics doing their things had nothing to do with what was written and jimmy was you know as i say every detail he had he knew exactly what he wanted. i just wanted to see some real acting Hmm. Wow. Dear, dear, dear man, too. Yeah, great, great actor. Like I said, Manchurian Candidate. Yes. He even did, he even went full makeup. He was in Planet of the Apes. He was what he was in that. There you go. Yeah. Jim, Jim was some. Another one. Cast. He was a terrific guy. You can go on. Who else you got? You got oh. Ron Carey. Ronnie Carey. Well, Ronnie was the only... At the, well, even he, excuse me, he wasn't in the original cast. Uh, Landisberg was a, uh, had guessed it on the show. If you look back, if, if you find that Landisberg played a, uh, a phony Bible salesman. Okay. And Ronnie had come in as um, the mole. He dug a hole from one store down underneath and up into a bank. So he came in <laughs> coughing the whole time because <laughs> it was filthy from having been in a tunnel. The, that was Ronnie. And Danny didn't care that they had played another character. He said, no, he's good. And he created the character of, of, uh, that came up. You know, the I'm glad you made that point because that's another thing. It wasn't even in the notes, but remembering the show so well, you had actors that came back and played other roles. They were so good. Mm -hmm. Oh, if I was any good with names, I could give you his name. I, I could see his face. Played, I, I believe, seven different characters in the run. Short Jewish guy? 
Um, he was, if I, oh, I can't think of his name, I could see him, very thin hair. No, the one I'm thinking about was in 10. Do you remember the picture 10? Yeah, like Dudley Moore. Dudley Moore, well, he was the neighbor across the street with the telescope. Oh, I have to look and see. After we'll do the interview, it'll come yeah, but Seven different characters he yeah. played. And Danny didn't care. Danny said, no, they're good. It's a different year. You know, he only cared about putting on a good show every week. That's all. Well, you know, that, that's interesting. There's a parallel there. Rod Serling, who you know, did The Twilight Zone. Rod used a lot. I know it was different. It wasn't comedy, but he used a lot of the same actors, too, in a lot of different episodes as different characters. Talent is talent. I mean, if, period. The, the last one that had was on several episodes I wanted to ask you about was Gregory Sierra. Gregory was only on the show about a couple of years, and then he left to do his own show, uh, Hudson Street. Okay. He did his Hudson Street. Uh, Gregory, they tell me that he, I, I, I'm hearing this years later, that he always objected to the fact that when he lost his temper, he would speak Spanish. He didn't want to be a, a quote, Latin. He wanted to be just himself. Okay. Uh, that was one of the things I heard. Gregory and I had a strange relationship. You know, more people knew who the hell Gregory Sierra was than Hal Linden when we started. Nobody knew who I was, except some theater goes from New York. Uh, Gregory had just done uh, Sanford and Son, wasn't it? Yeah, he yeah, played Sanford Major role, and and that's how we got uh, Barney. I think he was put in by the network. I don't, I don't know exactly. Okay. But um, we had a strange, not abrasive, just a strange relationship. I think because of that, that I coming, you know, somebody you never heard of was now the star of a show. And he was a, you know, a major television name. Okay. So I'll, let's just leave it at that. No problem at all. One of the episodes that I watched again, and I saw clips on YouTube, and I thought it was a, a brilliant piece of acting by you and by Abe, just chewing up the scenery, but it was an emotional scene, was when Abe was leaving, and you were telling him, you have to retire, Fish. You're 63. You have to retire. And he's like, no, I'm going to call this guy or that guy. And just the, the two of you in that scene, I mean, I thought it was a brilliant piece of acting. What do you remember about that particular episode? Well, I, I don't recall that one specifically. I do remember talk with the, the long scenes, having long scenes in, with Abe. Okay. Because I was, what, the next oldest to him? Uh, so we were talking as as um, equals and uh, I remember there were always tough tough scenes tough relate it was a tough relationship especially when it was time for him to retire yes I, I don't remember doing it doing that scene but every scene as far as Danny was concerned was an acting scene not a comedy scene and I think that's probably the secret of its longevity. You still see it today. And it's still valid today. Mm -hmm. You, uh, I remember, uh, I don't remember what the function was, but uh, it was at a college class, I guess it was an acting class, I don't know. The professor put up, because I was the guest, put up a, a, an episode. And I could not get, yes, the jackets were a little funny looking, uh, you know. <laughs> right, the 70s. Uh, uh, Ron Glass in his Nehru jacket, yeah. <laughs> you know, and his hair changed all the time and whatever was, whatever was popular that year. But the, fun, the, the, the guts of the show, the structure and, the, and what we were talking about was as valid today as when we were talking about it. That's, that's, you know, I, I mentioned the Twilight Zone. You just mentioned Barney Miller. Both of those hold up today because of good writing. Good writing. And you don't, a, a lot of times today, and you know way better than I do, 
You just don't see it as much today, just like music. I mean, it's the same. You just don't see it as much. When you do, it's 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 a beautiful, it's a mitzvah when you do, but you don't see it like you use. In, in my opinion, I'm not trying to. I've done I've done some sitcoms since other people's sitcoms, good sitcoms. Right. I don't want to name them, but they're audience edited. If the audience doesn't laugh a hundred percent of the joke, they'll quickly put in a new line for the audience to, you know what I mean? Maybe the first line was more integral and better for the characters. They're much more fascinated by the amount of laughter those 400 people from Omaha do. Right. It's, 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 now, there was no ad-libbing in Barney. No changing of, uh, you know, there was no audience. So we, we weren't responding to an audience. It was purely a writer's show. Executed by a great cast, but purely a writer's show. It was all written. Everybody, every line was written. Right. And I, I want to also mention another story that you told because it's very relevant. to Well, it is Barney Miller. Barney was never canceled. You told the story about how Danny, in the last year, and going, I think, into 82, said, I'm going to take scripts from everywhere. I don't care if it's a college student. I don't care who it is. And if I get something, we'll go. I'll tell you, like, in a two-month period. And if I don't, we're ending it. And he had to come back. He came back to you guys and he said, we're ending it. It didn't get canceled. He ended it. He ended it. Yeah. Was it because all, all those new scripts were really rewrites of what had already been written. You know, everybody put in a Barney Miller script. There was absolutely no new attack, nothing that he could. He said, we've done what we can. Let's all move on. And he ended it. Okay. Another gem that I found how researching you and I've been, it's been on loop, playing and playing over and over again, is you did a Carol Burnett uh, episode and you were sitting in a chair with a blue sweater on and a letter, and you did one one of the, to me, greatest American songwriters that doesn't get it. Well, he's finally getting his jest through. I know he's an Oscar winner, but he's not talked about enough today as Paul Williams. I think Paul Williams is a wonderful songwriter, okay? And you performed a song that he wrote, I Wouldn't Last a Day Without You. And you, not only did you sing it, you act, I, won't, I don't know if you want to say acted it, but you did what Sinatra did to me. You interpreted the lyric because I, I rewatched it. It was a beautiful performance. Talk about that. Your, my background is musical theater. I did, I, I don't know how many, I must have done, done about 15, 20 Broadway musicals in my life. The lyric is dialogue. The lyric of a song in a musical is dialogue. It's written as dialogue, or it was, it used to be, I don't know that about today, but a melody helped you say the, the, the line as if it was speech. The party's over. Da, 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 da. Not the party's over. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. the, the music was meant to, to make it easier to make it dialogue whether it's talking to yourself, whether it's talking to someone in your mind, it's dialogue. Every song I ever sang, therefore, is dialogue. I forgot completely about singing that song. Somebody's uh, picked it off, what, YouTube or somewhere? Yeah, I don't know. YouTube. And I, I, I saw it for the first time in what, 40 years, <laughs> I don't remember. And um, yes, it is. It was a scene. It was dialogue. There was a there was there was a you on the other end of that. Uh, I was uh, I was happy about it because it was in tune. <laughs> and this is before they had the little knobs to get you in tune. Right, right. Uh, so, uh, uh, and by the way, I know Paul very well. Paul is a not only a terrific writer, he's a terrific guy. 
I, Hal, if you could, if you could mention me, I would love to interview him. I've been trying to get in touch with him. But I, I haven't been able to, but I would love to have him on. I've, I've had his music. I know all about his career. I grew up on his music. I know he wrote with Barbara Streisand Evergreen and won the Oscar for it. I know he acted with Marlon Brando in The Chase. People forget that he was an actor. Oh, I know about Paul Williams. Okay, going uh, after Bonnie Miller, you get you won two daytime Emmys, and you did children's shows, Animals, 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 and FYI, or three. three I'm sorry, three. You won three, right, daytime Emmys. Right. Well, who's challenging? Well, who's you, did, you did. I got in the next one. You're right. <laughs> Talk about Animals, 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 and FYI. Um, yeah, both uh, interesting, fascinating shows. Animals, 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 again, an animal show for kids, um, was a, a, it had different, all I did was the introductions to each of the elements. There was, they would pick an animal a week, and there was a song about the animal, there was a sketch about the animal, there was a, a, the, the facts, you know, the information about the animal, and I introduced each segment. The thing is that I always did it with the animal involved. And so I've been bit, <laughs> sat upon, <laughs> peed upon, oh, nipped, frightened to death. <laughs> you, were, you were the Jewish Marlon Perkins. <laughs> I was the Jewish Marlon Perkins. I remember standing, holding a, a globe in which a, uh, a tarantula, with a tarantula in it, talking, introducing uh, the next segment. And the tarantula crawled out of the bowl and up my arm. <laughs> wow, we talked about frightened. Uh, a little monkey, I was holding a nice little monkey, turned on me and grabbed and bit me in the, in the arm. Uh, it was fascinating though, it was all shot the whole season because all I did with the intros was shot in, um, couple of weeks and usually at a zoo or a wild animal park. Good experience, nice experience. Except for the, um, what are those big turtles? Uh, the, snapping turtles the snapping ones? Yes, because I had to squat because the, the cameraman kept saying, get closer, closer, closer. They wanted a, a more intimate shot. And I was squatting so long that that started my knee problems that has haunted me. I now have a new knee there, actually. Uh, but uh, it was a terrific experience. Uh, the other show was fascinating information that uh, one minute spots um, about all kinds of things, a whole, whole plethora of, of information about things. It was the first time I ever heard about uh, what was it? Turkey being something was good for sleeping. I'm trying to remember what it was. Okay, <laughs> but we, I would, I would learn all these things as I was doing them. Fascinating. Great shows. I, I like I, said, I had forgotten about them when I was doing the research. I remember there, those shows. They were are, shows. There are a couple of books out. Uh, oh. they, they put them into book form, and they wanted to say. They wanted me to. It wanted to be by Hal Linden, and I said, "Not. I didn't write any of this. I didn't research it. I, so I believe it was as narrated by." Uh, Hal Linden. Okay. All right. Another thing you did in the '80s, and I have actually have it downstairs because I collect assets. Uh, well, as we're talking about animals, my, you know, I'm at home, so my little Havanese, which is named Santino Corleone after the Godfather wants to be in the shot, he keeps coming out. That's why I'm, if you see me going like this, I'm trying to keep him from barking. <laughs> he, everybody wants in the laugh. Come here, Santino, let me show, let me show you this. He wants, he wants in the act. Oh, oh. Right, now you're in the act, pal. Now you're in the act. <laughs> he really looks dangerous. <laughs> Santino Corleone. Santino <laughs> Corleone. Yeah, Berkwood, so he's an Italian Jew like me. Okay, stop, you gotta go over here, stop. Shh. Okay. Um, you play Jack L. Warner in the biopic of one of my favorite actors, Earl Flynn. Talk I have about, to talk about miscasting, huh? <laughs> Santino, no. Jack Warner was like five foot six or something. Right. <laughs> and uh, 
anyway, um, I've always enjoyed playing characters that are not anywhere close to me, you know what I mean? Uh, I've been on Broadway many times, uh, you know, uh, playing totally ca character parts. Right. But then again, I've always approached almost every role as a character part. Uh, but uh, I remember enjoying, uh, because Jack, one of the other things I discovered in my research on Jack Warner was that he used to tell jokes all the time. He, he wanted to be a, a, a performer and ended up uh, in the movie business because his family had uh, movie theaters in Pennsylvania, I think it was. Okay. And that led on to his later career. So I, I just looked for every possible place, to, wherever I was to do a joke about it. And they kept a lot of them in. Okay. <laughs> yeah, a lot of fun. Okay. Uh, what, what other sitcom that you were on that I want to talk about because I really enjoyed it came on right before I joined the Navy in 1986 was Black's Magic. Now, I know you spoke. That was not a sitcom. What's that? That was not a sitcom. Yeah, I mean, TV show. Right, right. That's a, thank you for correcting me. Right, TV show. I know I've seen clips of you speaking very fondly of working with Harry. Um, it was a wonderful, like wonderful relationship. He was, he was just terrific. Lovely, lovely man, helpful every time, you know, no ego, terrific. Okay. I saw a clip on YouTube, you don't know if you remember this episode, but guy gets off of like a Winnebago, or a, a mobile home or whatever they call him, and he's in a, uh, an outfit and he takes a thing on you and, and Harry and he's like checking you for like contamination. And Harry says something to you like, they're coming from Mars, and you said not in a trailer, trailer like that. And Harry, and you, Harry says, "You never know." It was just a funny line, funny line. But um, want to move forward. Twenty eleven, you released the CD. Hell ending. It's never too late. That CD took me about thirty years to produce. I, um, it started. When I was Barney, I thought maybe I could revive the big band era. So I made, I cut four sides with the big band, but playing contemporary songs. Uh, I can't tell you which ones they were. Well, I know one of them was You Light Up My Life was on there. No, that's later. Okay. That was later. This is when you recorded. Okay, I got you. I got you. These are the four with the big band. There are four with a big band sound. Okay. Okay. And uh, including one with just a clarinet playing big band jazz. Uh, and I thought maybe, you know, we, I could start something and, you know, get a big band back to play contemporary songs, not the old classics, but up to date songs. Uh, that uh, was met with a lot of <laughs> skepticism by most people in the business and I put it in my in the drawer and forgot about it. Then I went, I was in New York doing, I forget, on stage and uh, ran into an old friend of mine and we talked about, you know, doing stuff and he said, let me, we'll do, so we ended up doing four more cuts, but these were studio cuts. And that's was one of the. That's where I did you my, life, my life as a as a gospel tune. Oh, okay. With the organ and the girl singers, you know, um, all of the tunes I did were hits, but I tried to find a new approach to them. Um, anyway, we did four more cuts. I loved them. Nobody else did. As much as you love them, that's really all that counts. Honestly. Went into the drawer with the other four. Okay. Uh, about a dozen years later, uh, so I was working in Florida, and, and the lady who booked me said, why don't you finish that damn thing? Or at least we'll have something to sell at the door. So I went home and did four more. And we released... Uh, the album, as I said, that's my entire career. 
<laughs> on that CD. I was looking at the tracks. You got some great tracks on there. Uh, they're still played on the Sinatra channel. On uh, with, oh, with Nancy. Yes, they're still played on that on that channel. An another one on YouTube is I watched this, about 15 minutes of it. I don't think that's the whole show, but I, I know it's available on DVD. Is um, Hal Linden? I'm um, an old fashioned show where you, you sing, you do clarinet, you tell stories. I thought it was fantastic. And you even did a clip from the Rothschilds where you did your makeup and you, you aged yourself. But you were playing clarinet. And like I said, my father, God rest his soul, I'm, I'm so happy that he was my dad because he was born in 1928. I was born in 68, so it was 40 years. But I grew up on, so when you were saying people like Gene Krupa, and Woody Herman, you were talking about him in your head. I heard this music in my house. I, I mean, it wasn't during that, that time, but my, it was during my father's time. I, I, a I, show. Well, I've been actually doing some version of that show since the Rothschilds. What happened was, well, early on in my career, as I said, when I was trying to make a living and doing all these things, I also tried doing an act and, you know, and it was like the other stuff, not too well, you know, polite applause, not very well received. So I kind of gave up on it. I always thought of myself as a uh, recordable, you know, a record, possible record artist. Music changed under my watch and all of a sudden I was what they call a dinosaur, you know. It was way too late for me to have a musical career, but I, 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 I after the Rothschilds, I had many uh, invitations to perform at a, a dinner, just do two numbers, or do your act here at this uh, uh, hotel or whatever it was. So I had to put an act together. I did, and I have been performing some version of that ever since. Uh, some, added some writers, added some uh, humor, added a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and uh, and I've been doing it ever since. The best kept secret in show business. Well, you know what? I laughed when you did Mac the Knife and you said, I've had so many different arrangements on Mac the because, you know, we, you know it's a, such a great standard. And you were telling the story about, I've did, done this so many different, you know, this way. But as soon as you started and you, you did it on my show, I said, he's so, you're so musical, where you were doing, and you were doing it in the act, how you were doing the arrangement, and then you were kid, you were kibitzing with the piano player. I mean, it's, I love those type of shows. That's, that song, Mac the Knife, I used to do as a musician. Okay. And I actually did do it that way, which is why it's the only time I've ever heard Mac the Knife in one key. Usually goes up a half tone. Oh, I would probably did it. <laughs> right. This one is all in one key because I couldn't ask musicians who were faking it to change the keys. So we did it in one key. But that's what I did. I used to bring in a, you know, a trumpet and a trombone and, a, you know, whatever I had to build an arrangement on Mac the Knife. And I, when I finally remembered, I said, wait, wait a minute, I could do that in the act. And it, now it's a written arrangement, but it, it, it was, the concept started when I was indeed faking it. Okay. Yeah. In 18, you did a film called The Samuel Project. And I saw, and I, I know what the premise of it is, it's very moving. I watched the trailer on it. I haven't seen the full movie. I want to get it or, or order it or however I can get it. Talk about that project because that's a very, very deep project movie. It was an interesting project because <clears throat> I think I got the job because I was working in town. I was doing a play in San Diego at the Old Globe. And these guys were putting together a script. Originally it was about my character really and, and the relationship with somebody who had been my enemy in, in, in uh, Germany at the time. But when it was uh, given a frame, it became about my grandson who wanted to tell my story. So uh, I was doing actually, uh, I think it overlapped a few days. I was actually doing the play at night and well, working on the picture by day. And uh, 
I, I was involved with the director. We sat and reworked the uh, the spine of the play of the picture. So it really became about a boy trying to accomplish uh, trying to accomplish something and getting people to 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 help him to do it. And uh, it was about something that a lot of Holocaust survivors don't like to talk about. So it was, he had to get the whole thing out of me and slowly and finally put the project together. It was a school project. Okay. Uh, right, right. He, he was drawing pictures. And, and mixed media where he could use uh, drawing, he could use live, whatever. Um, and then he had to tell us a, a, a real historical story, something that was real. And he focuses on his grandfather's history. But the whole picture is about him getting me to tell it, getting his father to support, you know, to help him. And everybody's got their own problems in life. And he really eventually puts it together. It's only about three, four, five minutes long. I don't know, you know, the whole, but it's, it captures everything that, that the relationship between the grandfather and the grandson is it's all in there <coughs> and it's a it is a touching picture yeah it looked like it. i want to say i'm my father through my father i knew holocaust survivors i, I know very few left now but when i was much younger because i lived in miami beach after new york well we didn't want to make it another holocaust picture we didn't want to compete with spielberg we couldn't so we tried to keep it about telling the story not you know, the story itself, uh, we made kind of, well, it's not your typical hol Holocaust uh, remembrance because <clears throat> we didn't want to tread on those toes. Okay. So it's a very, it's more about the people today framed in a Holocaust uh, situation. Okay. One other question I want to ask is that I want to segue into the, the second part and the last part of the interview. I want you to talk about, because I know it's important, um, you have been, a, if it's, come here, Santino. Come here, come here, come here. He's right behind the camera. I know what he wants, he wants to go out. Um, you've been a spokesperson, it looks like, since 1997 for the Jewish National Fund. Please talk about that. Um, I grew up in a, um, a family in the Bronx, Jewish family. My mother was kosher. But not kosher from a religious standpoint, kosher from a cultural standpoint. That's the only way she knew how to cook. And that's the, that's the way she was raised and that continued. My father was a twice a year Jew. He would go to the uh, Passover and Yom Kippur. That was it. Never went the rest of the year. So it was not a heavily religious household, but it, it was, uh, it, it was tribally Jewish. My father was an, an ardent Zionist. And we're talking, when I was growing up as a, as a baby, the 30s, there was no such thing as Israel. It's still aspirational. And I've always, I was a eight year old assimilationist. Who needs another country? We've got one here. I was fine playing in the streets with my Italian friends, my Irish friends, you know. It wasn't until after the war, actually when I was now a teenager, late, late teens, and it was the behavior of the British when survivors of the, of the Holocaust were trying to get to Israel and they wouldn't let him in. They made him go to Cyprus and held him in. in oops, sorry. No, okay. Let me turn this off. Okay. Okay. I don't know. It'll be ringing in another room. You may hear it. Okay. Anyway, brought me around to my father's point of view. Okay. That there had to be. If there were. If they were going to say to us, go back where you came from, there got to be a place to go. Right. That was the, my concept. And here the British were not letting them. 
So that turned me into, into a Zionist. Uh, I was approached, actually. I always was a part of, you know, the blue, little blue can and, and all the, mm-hmm. uh, and doing a, a thousand uh, benefits for Jewish causes, all. So I was always kind of involved, but they asked me to, to become the spokesman. And so in one of the, I didn't know exactly what they did. So they took my wife and myself and they took us to Israel to see okay. what the Jewish National Fund does in Israel. And uh, I got all caught up in the water. The fact that, you know, Israel is a desert, for God's sake. Mm-hmm. And they have to find water and make water. And how do you do that? And they were doing it. I remember going into a research lab where they had five boxes of strawberries hanging one under the other. And they would, and the experiment was how many drops of water do we need on the top one to make sure that the bottom one gets enough water? Because it would go through, mm-hmm. right? Right. Down. How many drops is what they were talking about? That's how how difficult it was in those days. It's still difficult, but the work that they've done, there is a uh, reservoir near the, uh, near the uh, Jordan River. They had a lot of reservoirs. They catch water in rain, they, they uh, well, desalinate it, but these reservoirs are filled with water that they've managed to to fill and they keep it and keep it clean so they can use it. Uh, that's got my father's name on it. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, so was I just continuing my father's legacy? I'll settle for that. Okay. So I become their spokesman for lo these many years. Okay. Been back to Israel many times, bringing people to show them, particularly what. JNF does, and um, so it became a, it became a major part of my life. I but I always come back to that I'm really just doing what my father wanted. I remember seeing him the day that Ben Gurion declared the state of Israel, 1948. I was still living at home. And I walked into the house, the, the, the living room was dark. And I saw my father sitting in a, in a chair, weeping. The man had spent his whole life trying to, fighting for that. And here it was. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. That's a beautiful thing. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say this. I don't want to bring you into politics, but I will make this one statement. Um, my dad, it, it, I know you're Jewish. My dad's side is, is Jewish. My mother's side was Italian, is Italian. When you hear comments about that episode in Charlottesville, that there were fine people on both sides, and those other fine people were carrying tiki torches, saying Jews will not replace us, blood and soil. And I'll leave it at that. Because I, you know what I mean. I don't want, like I said, I don't want to put into politics, but it makes me sick. I, my, I, the picture of my father sitting in that chair weeping. That's what I saw on, uh, her names, I'm terrible. What's his name's face in Grand Park when Obama came out to acknowledge his election? And the audience was, uh, yeah, the big, the black activist who ran for president. Oh, Jesse Jackson. Jesse Jackson. Right. Weeping. Yeah. Weeping tears because something he'd worked on all his life was all of a sudden a possibility. Yeah. 
that's what when he was when I saw that picture, I thought of my father sitting in that chair. Yeah. Yep. And and you're right. The minute any kind of racist uh, behavior comes out, <laughs> we'll get carried along on it. Yes. There's always going to be an anti-Semitic reference. Absolutely. Absolutely. But unfortunately, we live in that world. So far. So far, it's a lot better than it was when I was a kid. I gotta right. say that, but it ain't gone yet. No, it's it's not. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't want to put you in politics. All right, the last part of the interview is just random, fun questions, quick thoughts off of your head. Whatever you say is good for me. Let's start out with what is your favorite genre of movies? Genre of movies. I mean, this is going to be a stupid answer. Good ones. <laughs> no, it's not. I'm serious. <laughs> I go to every movie looking to get involved. I really don't go as a critic. I really go as a as a as a viewer. The minute something happens that's phony, or overdone, or obvious, or crack goes that relationship. So. A well done movie is my one that doesn't have, where I can't see the seams. Okay. Favorite, in, in any genre, obviously, favorite musical band? Uh, well, it would be a toss between uh, Stan Kenton and Woody Herman. Oh, boy. The Peanut Band. Sorry to go back that far. No. But I didn't follow it any other. Earth, Wind, and Fire uh, impressed me as well on the way but wasn't uh wasn't june christie the singer for stan kenton at one time yeah i believe so yes yeah. and the peanut vendor i love stan kenton he's great great four brothers yeah what a, what an artist listen to four brothers okay if you ever get your hands on it. who is your personal favorite male singer Too many, too many, and, and all of us have our flaws. <laughs> too many. Uh, I think there are, you know, uh, Sinatra didn't have the best voice. Probably Vic Damone did. But I never thought of, you know, Vic just didn't move me. Uh, Sinatra swung. <laughs> uh, you know, I thought I had the best voice. Sinatra, I'm a, Sinatra's my favorite, Hal. But I, I say he didn't have the best voice either. I thought one of the best voices was Dick Hames. I thought Dick Hames had a fantastic Dick Hames, voice. Dick Hames, that's another era. That's even before Sinatra. Right. That's, that's when that was... You have to understand what happened in the music business. When they were records... You had to be able to sing for two and a half minutes perfectly. Mm -hmm. There was no editing that record. It wasn't the tape that they could cut it together, cut one take and do that. So the people who had to record on records had to be able, had to have voices that they could maintain for, and, and maintain perfectly for two minutes and 35 seconds or however long. A, 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 a side was. That was the era of Dick Haynes and uh, 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 Billy Eckstein. Oh, yeah. Big voices. Yes, yes. You know. Do you like, um, just out of curiosity, do you like Matt Monroe? Matt Monroe. I'll put that on the list. Yeah. Yes. More, right. of, a, more of a stylist than a great voice. But, yes. But yes. Okay. Yeah, there were a lot of was a really good uh, Jerry Vale had a great voice but Jerry sang songs that didn't interest me right it's interesting you brought Jerry up I interviewed Jerry Vale years ago and Jerry and Al Martino were neighbors and I'm cutting my grass and my ex-wife now says hey you got a phone call it's Al Martino like, Al Martino I had no idea what it's calling so I pick up the phone Al says hey you did an interview with Jerry Vale He's my neighbor in Beverly Hills. He enjoyed it. Would you be interested in doing one with me? Because I used to do, I, 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 my, my, my started interviews was boxing. So 
they both love boxing, so they were both. But Jerry Vale, he he was interesting because he didn't really have a he's decent on records, but he didn't really have hit songs. Where Al was the opposite. Al had hit songs. Right. You know, with here in my heart and. But oh. Jerry, Jerry had his following. Jerry had a following. Jerry had a People big... loved his voice. Oh yeah, I love. <laughs> he had a terrific voice. A beautiful. I give a... Yeah. Yeah, in fact, um, I like when. And, and the other one that uh, he got in trouble because he didn't go play for Dolly Sinatra when when she wanted him to come perform, but had a great voice from that era was Jimmy Roselli. Jimmy Roselli was a was a big singer too at one time. Yeah. He got in trouble with Sinatra, <laughs> but anyways. Uh, female, do you have a favorite female singer? Uh, probably Streisand. Okay. Probably which, Streisand. Is, which is interesting because when you were talking about understudy, I interviewed about 10 years ago, Lainey Kazan. Lainey. Lainey was the understudy to Barbara. And look what you were doing, well, she was doing. And always replaced her. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you, since you're such a music... Lainey had a great voice. Oh, yeah, yeah, she had a fantastic great voice. In fact, I think she's, she, unfortunately, she fell, she caught her heel in some tile and she tripped. She just had surgery on her, her leg, she broke her leg or foot. So she's coming out, I think at the end of the month, she's going to do an interview with me again. Um, since you're so musical, just out of curiosity, do you, do you have a certain song that comes to you that you hum or you sing like this, you know, you're in the shower, you're driving somewhere, and it's just one of those songs. Um, the the song that jumps to my fingers when I play the clarinet, if I want to play some jazz, is There Will Be Another, Never Be Another You. I love the chord progressions. Okay. Yeah. The song that jumps to my fingers, to my voice, I'm still singing just in time. <laughs> great song, great song. All right. Do you have a favorite noise or sound that you like to hear? Hmm. Noise or sound. Um, nice. It's nice to be near the ocean and hear, you know, the ocean waves slapping on the ocean. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I can't think of anything else. Oh, Silence is wonderful. I love <laughs> the library. Flip it. Do you have a least favorite sound that you like to hear? Um, high screeches, I guess. Okay. Favorite favorite type of food? <sighs> you put anything in front of me, and I'll eat it. I am. <laughs> I am. I'm the. Uh, uh, Probably pasta, so uh, okay. a good a good bowl of pasta. Are you a cook? I'm a preparer. Okay. So uh, when I make pasta, it's uh, canned, so you know, bottled sauces. But I put in onions and mushrooms. I add them to, to, to everything. You know, sauté them. You sauté onions, and your shoes will taste good. <laughs> okay. Okay. If you were to hit the big lottery, two, three, four hundred million dollar lottery, you, did it, you got a ticket and you won, what would be the first thing you'd do? Well, at my age, uh, just make sure my, I have four kids, uh, four families that are really being ruined by the pandemic. And that's where my, where my mind is. I just want to make sure that they're all okay. That would be it. There's nothing. I, I've been around the world. I've been just about everywhere I ever wanted to be. I've done just about everything I wanted to do. I skied with Scott Stein Erickson. I, I sang with uh, the greats. I sang with uh, everybody. Uh, I played the clarinet with major symphony orchestras. I... Uh, Played tennis with uh, pros. Played golf with Arnold Palmer. Hmm. I, I, I've done everything. Okay. I am looking to the future. 
when I will not be here. Hopefully to make it a better future. I now have a great grandchild. Oh, okay. Uh, there are problems in this country, in this world that are going to affect her, not me. But uh, I would take that money and, and make sure that, that, that it's easier for those kids. And my okay. Grandchild. My great grandchild. Okay. That's what I would do. All right. If you if you could meet one person from any time in history, does it, any any time, who would you like to meet, and what would be the first question for him? Oh my God! You should have asked me this before. I could have thought about it. I. I <laughs> That's okay. Any time in history. Any time. It could be somebody you read about. It could be it could be a family member. Any anybody. Whoever whoever you pick is the right answer. I, I don't have an I don't have a funny answer for you. Okay. <laughs> I don't have an intelligent answer for okay, you. Okay, that's fair. Okay. okay. With everything that we discussed, Hal, in a sentence or two, how would you sum yourself up as a human being? Uh, well, the first word I would use is lucky. Very lucky. I survived in, in, a, in a business that's vicious, that, that beat down very talented people that I know. I got lucky in marriage. I got lucky with kids. They're, I have four wonderful kids. None of them will be president, but they're human beings. They're all social human beings. They they re they recognize their place in society and they're and, and what they're and what they what they uh, what they owe to society. Uh, I can uh, everything in my life. <laughs> I I got lucky. There's no reason. I was not the most talented singer on Broadway. I was not the most actor or funny actor on television. I, I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. I could tell you, you know, twice in my life that I know of where it was purely just the fact that that piano player in Fort Belvoir asked me, I didn't say, hey, can I come with you and sing a song or something? I, I didn't even think about it. If he hadn't asked me, would my entire life have been different? Probably. Talk about lucky. Mm -hmm. Talk about lucky. Uh, bells are ringing. You know, lucky. I got Barney Miller because Danny Arnold saw me on stage in the Rothschilds. He never came backstage to say, liked your performance. He didn't write me a note. I didn't know that the man existed. Three years later, or two and a half years later, when they were doing the, when they were casting Barney Miller, and the network, believe me, gave him a list of who they thought should be Barney Miller. All those people with high TV cues, you know, mm -hmm. people knew or liked. He said, "No, I saw this actor on Broadway. I'm going to use him." That was it. Is that not lucky? Uh, Bless it's a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah. So I look on my whole life that I have been the recipient of some incredible luck and uh, that's why I'm not overly disturbed about things in my life anymore. You know, nothing gets, nothing gets me angry. I'm, I'm way past due for length of my life. March, I turned 90. That's, and I'm still functioning. Yeah. You can't be any luckier than that. Okay. You've done interviews for many, many, many years. Is there one question that a interviewer never asked you and you always said, I wish he or she would have asked me this question. And if there is one, what's the answer? Uh, actually, there's a, 
No, all the questions that you've asked all the questions that everybody else has asked about my life. I've answered all these questions before. Um, the one uh, strange question or odd question that I got, my, the only time an interviewer asked me, is there anything that you can do that nobody knows about? Okay. Good question. <laughs> And I had an answer for him. I can tie a bow tie perfectly without using a mirror. Hmm. That's a strange <laughs> talent. It started with a band leader who didn't like the bow tie I, I was using or, and taught me how to tie a bow tie. Hmm. Now, does that sound like the world will change. It actually came to pass. <laughs> I played a, a role in a play. Oh, it was a musical version of a uh, 1930s movie about, but uh, the, uh, Dodgeworth, a musical version of Dodgeworth. And there was a scene in in a, a cabin on a on an ocean liner, and my wife and I were getting dressed to go sit at the captain's table. So I start the scene in uh, socks with, with garters and underwear. My wife is off stage in the dressing room getting dressed. And we had this conversation. And as I do it, I get dressed through the whole scene. I put my shirt on, I button my buttons, put my pants on. But, and then it comes time to put my bow tie on because we're going, it's, this is uh, tails, but, uh, you know, on the ship. Mm -hmm. And I said to the director, how about, where do I put my bow tie on? Is, is there a mirror? He says, no, the mirror is on the downstage wall. Now, what does that mean? That means I walk to the edge of the stage, look out over the audience and pretend there's a mirror there and tie my bow tie. That man hired probably the only actor in all of actors equity who could do that <laughs> i because as a musician i had to learn how to tie a better boat that's funny that's a funny story that's that's the only question that ever put me aback wow every, every other one I've, I've pretty much heard except who do i want to meet from the you know what person do i that's there are too many <laughs> <laughs> okay okay Final question of the interview, Pal. Do you have a saying you live your life by? Yes. Take everything in life seriously, except yourself. Okay, good one. Good one. People need to. Know. People who take themselves seriously are the people who get us in trouble. That's true. That's true. Well, Hal, it was great talking to you. I really, really appreciate it. I love John Barney Miller. I love John a lot of things, but doing the uh, the research for this, finding out all these other things, the music and all that, I, I just I, it was great. It was great, and I want to tell the viewers, uh, Hal has a website, HalLinden.net is the website, his personal website. Thank you so much. And again, if you talk to Paul Williams, I'd love to interview Paul Williams. <laughs> uh, uh, I haven't seen Paul. Well, I haven't seen anybody. You know, send, a, send a send a bird. Send a, you know, tie it to the pigeon's foot and send it, send it over. But hey, I greatly appreciate it. You take care. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye.